We've seen a lot of movement in the transfer portal, and it isn't all good. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockout Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He's site editor over with Athlon Sports is inside the Huskies. And I'm the site editor with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. So, Lars. There's there's been a whole lot to talk about. We're gonna get to. I know that Kaliki Latu did come first. We like to go sequentially with a lot of things on on this show, but we can't today. We've got to start with the the offensive line mania that we saw. I feel like that's the only fair way to put it. Where you know we saw Chris Adams just out of the blue flip his commitment from Washington to Memphis, and and then uh, Enoch Vimaihai he ends up transferring from Ohio State to Washington. So let's start with the bad news here. Let's start with Chris Adams who. Uh, our, our good buddy Ben Glassmeyer hopped on an emergency show with me last week. And we talked a lot about Chris Adams and how there's a lot of potential there. There was a lot to work with at left tackle, which is obviously just such an important position. But, but tell, tell us a little bit more about what you might have heard about just this this transfer. Yeah, this was one, again, to be fair, it did catch us a little bit off guard. But in this day and age in the college football portal, you can kind of see why guys and coach, and this could also be a mutual parting of ways where because the coaches can't acknowledge it. Right, they can't. The, yeah. the coaches, the head coach Jed Fish, Brennan Carroll, the coaching staff at Washington cannot acknowledge Chris Adams until June seventeenth. This is an example of a guy where they coaches can take all these commits, retweet some of these guys, all that, but they can't actually confirm anything until they enroll for the summer session with the league program. It could be that Adams just wanted to ch- had a change of heart, wanted to stay maybe a little closer to home, which does make sense if you think about coming from Old Dominion, going to Memphis, he's staying on the east side of the country. Nothing wrong with that. But it also then does kind of put Washington in a tough spot. Where they didn't know it was coming, and they yeah. were actually penciling him in to start or at least be a contributor this fall. Now you have to go back into the portal and find somebody else. I do have a hard time believing the staff would be off, caught off guard in that regard just because the, there's so many – moving parts and, and variables to this process that there's some alignment that they brought in that we haven't even mentioned yet. Probably. So there's other guys that they're looking at that we don't even know the names that the fans don't even know the names of. So it's a six or one half dozen of the other. It's obviously kind of an unfortunate situation because you did like the depth that he provides, but in the same sense, it wasn't a Justin Harrington potentially plug and play or, you know, things like that, where it's the absolute, you can't miss on this guy. Darn. Now it almost, the Marcus Braun loss was worse, even though he never actually yeah. publicly committed. That loss was more significant because that's an immediate plug and play type player. Chris Adams was going to come in and compete for time. Potentially could have started as he did at Old Probably Dominion last season. Probably would have started, in my opinion. But the other thing to consider is, as we talked off the show, there's still three, four, potentially five offensive linemen coming in. What's not to sure. say that one of those guys isn't a plug and play type? Granted, you kind of have to wonder when you look in the portal, who is that guy? But I think this coaching staff, at least in the first six months, you deserve the benefit of the doubt. Now, if you get to June, if you get to fall camp, and there's only two or three more linemen added and you don't have that true starter, then there's cause for concern and legitimate criticism can come the way of the coaching staff. So I think that's all fair, but you can't understate that this is a really big loss. And, you know, it's it's because it really did come out of the blue. We're, boy, I, I know you didn't see this coming. I didn't see this coming. There, there was no rumblings that this was something that was going to be coming out. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't stick especially when you just look at the situation that the offensive line is in, where that was one of the bigger takeaways from the spring game on the negative side, where we talked about a lot of the positives in terms of, you know, the atmosphere, in terms of the, some of the skill players, but the offensive line still needs a lot of help. And we've been withholding judgment because we want to see what it looks like in fall camp when there are some more transfers in here. One that, you know, it, it all kind of is sorted out in their 14, 15, 16 scholarship bodies at the position but we're not there yet. So this is all we have. This is all we have to work with. And 
you know, it's it, it's tough to find a positive angle because there, there isn't one. But when you look at especially the potential that Chris Adams did have and, you know, the, just the more the season went on for him at left tackle, he did get better and better and better. So it's just it, it, it's just it's also shocking that somebody would want to pass up an opportunity to start at left tackle in the Big Ten. If there are other things going on outside of football that, you know, Jed Fish's coaching staff can't control, that's one thing. But we can't speak on that. But one thing we can speak on is Enoch Vimaihai, who did commit to Washington, former top 125 recruit out of uh, Kahuku in Florida, went to Ohio State, uh, played there for five seasons. I, I saw the, uh, I believe it was on the Fan Nation site, where they said that he played in 35 games over his five seasons, started two of them. But this is somebody who, no matter what the, the actual number is there, where I know 27 is a big number that I've seen. Uh, it, it's somewhere in that range. He's played a lot of games at Ohio State, started a couple of them, has certainly struggled. I know you, you talked to a source who gave you a little bit more insight on that as well. Yeah, this was something that also did reaffirm when Matt Castle told me when he came out to practice, just slight plug there, about the <laughs> offensive line situation at Ohio State over the past couple of seasons, where part of the reason why Michigan's been able to beat Ohio State has been in the trenches. And Simply put, the offensive line play at Ohio State hasn't been certainly up to the run game potential what it should be or what it used to be under the Urban Meyer days and kind of just what those old Ohio State offensive lines used to do. But this is also as a player who, when did given the opportunity, didn't necessarily take that gavel and run with it. He didn't give the coach staff a reason to say, hey, play me more, give me more snaps. But in that same vein, he did play a career-high 57 snaps in the Cotton Bowl loss to Missouri this past season. So clearly there was a way for him forward, but it just necessarily didn't seem like it was going to be at Ohio State. The indications that I've been given are this kid certainly does have first-team quality, first-team potential. And when he, as we noted, kind of hinted at former four-star prospect, that's essentially what you see, right? A guy that has potential but hasn't proven it and doesn't have proven production at the college level. But a guy that, especially in the situation that Washington is in, could come in, compete at right guard, likely more so than, more so than not, I would expect him at right guard. He played 157 yeah. in snaps at Ohio State at right guard. The other He had played 127 at left guard, and I believe 60 or 70 at left tackle. I don't expect him to be a tackle. No. We both expect guard to be the starting left guard. We're not said and done when the dust settles at the beginning of September. But you still have to have somebody on the right-hand side. Getting a veteran, especially to compete with either D'Angelo Gialli, some of these younger guys, just adds another extra bond to say, okay, if the other freshman guys don't necessarily come along in the summer and fall, we do have this veteran who has college experience, just hasn't met a starter and kind of gets his chance to shine or prove that he actually is capable of being a starter. So I certainly hear what you're saying. I, I watched some of that, that Cotton Bowl. Just remember watching that game. I went back and watched some of the tape. And it certainly isn't his brightest moment it, when when going back and, and watching that game. But there, there are certainly some qualities to take away from there. I, he looks like he can play with good power. I think that he has trouble anchoring sometimes in pass protection. And he just seems to have trouble bal just in, in terms of balance and forward leverage when it comes to the run game. Where those are certainly big issues, but those are things that Brennan Carroll should be able to work with. And just the fact that it's somebody with experience, especially experience in the Big Ten. Where a lot of what you're pointing to there, Lars, sounds like it could have been a coaching issue on the Ohio State side. And that's something where moving forward, if he can get better coaching over, he's he uh has two years of eligibility according according to uh, Ohio State's team page, where that's something if he can get some some good coaching this year and maybe even potentially next year as well from this Husky coaching staff, he could turn into a serviceable piece. And this is something where you're not asking him to come in and be a star. You're not asking him to come in and be just this highly touted, we need you to save this offensive line. But if he can come in, do a job, probably end up starting just in terms of the experience that he has under his belt. If he can do all those things and do them at a serviceable level, I feel that that's going to be a major step forward from what this offensive line has right now. And Lars, that being said, this wasn't the only position that added depth where Kaliki Latu committed on late Sunday night. And we'll get there right after a message from our good friends over at FanDuel because it's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL. And FanDuel's giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash lockout and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. And speaking of making every playoff shot count, I know I've, I've been on the Celtics and I, I know the everydayers have heard me talk about that over and over. 
over and over again. But somebody who I'd really like to see come out of the West is the Minnesota Timberwolves. Love watching Anthony Edwards play. That guy is just it's different. He's so much fun to watch at all three levels of the floor. And hey, shout out to the Huskies. They also have Jaden McDaniels on the roster. Love to see him go a little bit farther in the playoffs too as he, he really has been such a huge impact for that team on the defensive end of the floor. So Lars, this is one that you and I certainly discussed on our, our Monday show, and we've been hinting at it. We recorded our, our special bonus pod on Sunday, and Kaliki Latu committed later that night. Uh, somebody who is a product of California, played two years there, transferred to Nevada last season, and then got hurt about halfway through the year, so he couldn't finish out the season. And now he's going to be coming to Washington and play play for the Huskies just like his uh younger brother, excuse me, his older brother, Layatu Latu. It's, 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 it's funny because he, he is the, the younger brother, but he's the, the bigger one. So, you know, that, that, that throws me off a little bit because he's six, seven, two forty, and he could certainly make a huge impact for this team as, as kind of that, that tight end too. Man, I'm just, as you were saying that, cause you did say bigger cause he is taller, but I think Latu probably has, lately I, Layatu has yeah. more, um, has more has more on the frame in terms of mass. Oh, I for sure. Yeah. What, I, I couldn't imagine what Terry, the, their mother, had to go through in terms of those O line D line battles. I could just I could just see that. <laughs> that's why the Lots family is so good. People that that is worth noting. But no, this is a great addition. Again, it's that depth addition. That 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 second kind of tight end to help Decker to Graf come along in terms of that way he doesn't get thrown into a tight end two mold. Which again, he did deserve that. I think it's worth noting. He played we both very agreed well. Yeah. Throughout spring, he certainly would be capable of being a tight end too. But especially as a true freshman, you would think that have a second buffer there. Put Quentin Moore and, and uh, Kaliki Latu at your first two tight ends and then see what one of Ryan Ott and Decker Graf or potentially Charlie Crow could do in the fall as, as two, a pair of true freshmen and one, and one sophomore. But the other thing to consider is he does have starting experience, and that's the one thing nobody in this tight end room had. No, absolutely. And that's the thing where, you know, when we talk about Decker to graph, it's something I wrote about a little bit over on inside the Husky, excuse me, on Husky's wire, I'm getting, uh, have, have a nice little throwback there. But when, when I think about what Decker can do, it's, he's such a good receiver and bringing Kaliki Latu, who has so much more experience, especially as a blocker, it, it still allows him to play where I don't expect him to burn his red shirt, but I expect the coaching staff to try to find a way to use him in a role that you talked about the other day, a la Josh Cuevas, whereas he comes in every now and again as a kind of true pass catcher where that's going to be the main thing that he's asked, asked to do. And I feel like they're going to just kind of maybe schedule these four games and say, all right, these are the ones where we know we want to use Decker. Quentin Moore is obviously going to be the tight end one. And then with uh, Kaliki Latu behind him, between those two guys, you can run some of the 12 personnel that they like to and the, that they did in Arizona. You can run a whole lot of different things, and it allows you to do that. And Latu is also, like you said, an experienced pass catcher with starts under his belt, which is something this room, a lot like the offensive line, does not have a whole lot of. And it's really nice when you know you can have somebody like this, you can keep him in on the line and have him play as an extra blocker and do some of that stuff when... Again, we saw what the offensive line looked like in the spring game. We saw how many struggles there were up front. But getting some somebody like this in the room, it's not going to you know fill the need of a left tackle, but it's somebody that you can keep on that side and help chip and help do a lot of other different things to disrupt a pass rusher's timing to you know help keep a quarterback in rhythm and things like that. Yeah, when we talk about the multiplicity of this offense, you can honestly play both of them at the same time. One does in terms of will. Uh, Kaliki Latu and Decker to graph because one doesn't negate the other. It just allows Decker to come in more comfortably in terms of, okay, I don't have to assume all of these roles. I can just be the pass catcher. And if my play dictates that I should be playing more, the coaches are going to play more than five games. I guarantee you that if his play dictates that, but it allows them to say, Hey, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. We can, to your point, just play you in these four and let Kaliki do the rest. But that also does depend on what Ryan Otten can bring in the room because we saw him go through most of the spring healthy, but we haven't seen that beyond just two games in his two years at Washington. So to have that re – it's almost extra insurance. We, we talked about the word insurance yeah. a lot where that's exactly what you're trying to do in some of these positions. You're just trying to get that second body, that third body, and still allow the young guys to come up because this doesn't prevent Decker or even to a degree Charlie Kroll – Playing, I would say more Kroll because Kroll you would think would be more of a blocking sense in that role. But either way, 
it doesn't preclude the coaching staff from not burning their red shirt if the play dictates it, but it does allow that flexibility to stagger the room a little bit more and have another veteran presence because Otten, Otten is a veteran, just not on the field. And so kind of having that bridge gap between the two still allows Ryan to pr produce and do things like that. So it doesn't hurt the room in any way. It just adds more protection for the room, if anything. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that's what's so important about the tight end position where, especially when we look at, you know, what it has been at Washington under Jordan Pow Pow in previous years and what it's just how they were used in just the offenses of old and then how they were utilized at Arizona under this coaching staff, that it's something where it's, it can be a really big portion of the offense when needed where we saw Tanner McLaughlin be the best tight end in the Pac-12 in terms of uh, gaining receiving yards. So there's there's a whole lot that it can do. There's a whole lot that it can be in terms of scheme, in terms of blocking, in terms of receiving. And it's just, it's going to be so important this year because I feel that, you know, there are going to be some plays where as we watch this offensive line, I know I have to keep coming back to it, that the only thing that might be open is a little check down to a tight end where the ball's just going to have to be out so quickly that receivers aren't going to be able to even run some of these, these shorter routes that they have time that they need, you know, some time to develop on where it's still going to take a second or two. And Will Rogers is just going to have to look and say, Oh, the, the tight end is already breaking on his out route or just, just right here close to the line. I just need to get the ball out. I need to get it away where we saw him make some de decisions like that over the course of the spring game and even just throughout spring camp as a whole. So I wouldn't be surprised if just that's something where, you know, maybe he ends up with, we see Latu ending up with 35, 40, 45 catches on the season, where that seems like a high number, but we're going to see him utilize so often because he's going, Will Rogers is going to, need to get rid of the ball. Exactly. That's one thing that, especially to tie in kind of both these first few segments together, that's the theme of this, of this, of these ads, right? Where you're just, if we're penciling in Will Rogers, which we probably are, all he needs is two, two and a half seconds to get the ball out, whether it's fades, whether it's quick passes, whether it's slants over the middle. He doesn't need that much time because there's so many weapons on this offense, but he still does need a little bit of time. So in order to get both of those situations at, at any part of the field, that's the other side of this coin, especially when you talk about getting in the red zone, having that second and third tight end is important because you can have Decker, but if you have a, let's just say you don't add lot to it and it's, Quentin Moore, Ryan Ott, and Decker to grab, you really have two receiving tight ends and one blocking tight end. Then you do when you add Latu in the mix. Now you have two potential blocking slash receiving tight ends and a true receiving threat in Decker to grab, which allows Jedfish to get more creative in the red zone and do things like that. And that's all they really – you're just trying to create opportunity to score. You're trying to create opportunity that creates either opportunity for one player or another player – that ends up resulting in a touchdown. That's exactly what Jed Fish is – that's what it looks like Jed Fish is trying to build a Washington, at least for his first season. Absolutely, where they're they're not afraid to just send out two, three tight ends. Where You, you, you didn't mention Charlie Crowell in the last part of that conversation, and he's another guy who fits into that, that blocking role as well, where that's something where I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him get – two, three, four games under his belt as well, just because of just, there's, there's not a lot of depth at the position and we can see those guys just filling specific roles where he's somebody that I wouldn't be surprised if he's just the third tight end in the line of scrimmages, you know, they, they just send out a goal line package on the two yard line, try to get Jonah Coleman or Ken Davis, to just punch one in where that's that, but that's just kind of the extent that I see with, with a lot of that offense, just at the tight end position down in the red zone right now, or if they're, if they're a little bit farther away, sure. You can find a way to work some of these guys in, in terms of the passing game, but just in terms of where we've seen the plays going from what we've watched at spring camp, the tight ends haven't been a huge factor in the red zone. And I'm not entirely sure if that's just a product of what the offense is, or if that's a product of just what the position was this spring. And that could look a lot different this fall. Oh, no, it will look different this fall, but it's it's a mixed bag of both because it's certainly going to look different in the fall, but I do think there are elements of that in the spring that are going to carry over. It really it just comes down to having an element of both. I think that's being able to do multiple things really is what it comes down to because if you pigeonhole yourself into one or the other, you're selling yourself short on some regard. And so the, the one thing we haven't seen the staff do is – commit to one thing over another. They're really work like we saw Brennan Carroll work both sides of the offensive line. We saw Jordan Powerpa do a number of different things with the tight ends. Having that flexibility seems to be what this coaching staff is emphasizing instead of just saying we're going to commit to just the run or just the pass.
Absolutely. And Lars, that being said, there's there's still a whole lot of madness that's going on in the transfer portal. And we'll get there right after a message from our friends over at Monopoly Go. All right, game off. We got to pause here to talk about more about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. Flag on the play. You already talked about that, but there's just so much good stuff in this game. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock. And there's so much to get, like unique stickers you could trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes. Cool new playing pieces to drop on the board with and hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or Robot Pachinko Machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download it for free on the App Store or Google Play. Game on. So, Lars, a couple of the transfer, transfer portal news things that we got to mention real quickly here right off the top. Washington got a, tra- a commitment from a Colorado transfer, Cameron Warchuk, a long snapper, which is huge. And we'll get to that in a second I because just special teams is going to be really important for this team no matter what. And also, we saw Demarcius Davis announce a transfer to go back home to UCLA. Let's start with Warchuk. We don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it because, you know, no offense, it's a long snapper. And, Lars, I don't think we know a lot about long snapping to just, just, you know, be perfectly transparent about that. But this is something where Jaden green was certainly very solid throughout his time at Washington. Uh, And that's, that's just going to be important where, you know, if if the offense has trouble at times, you want to see somebody like that just back there, just that can be consistent. And that's exactly what Jaden green was both on, you know, field goals, extra points and in the punting game. So that's really nice. And then with Demarcy Davis at UCLA, I can't say I'm surprised. This is where he ended up. Especially after, you know, Dante Moore decides to transfer out. They're certainly looking for a body. And this gives him an opportunity to go home and still develop and and be a little bit closer to his family as well. Yeah, we'll start off with the first one. As I said to you off the the show, off the air, before we started recording, I'm willing to bet there is a special team snafu of sorts at Colorado in 2024 that will point back to this potential transfer is, hey, maybe you should have actually valued some of those guys that you didn't bother to learn the names of for Deion Sanders. But that's beside the point because when you look at Washington, they did have Alex Johnson as a long snapper during the spring. Caleb Johnson. But you look back. Or, Caleb. Or Caleb Johnson, sorry. Caleb Johnson, yeah. yeah. But, but when, you, when we talk about this, it's one of those, okay, you don't have a scholarship partner because both uh, – Saul and uh, Jack McCaster are walk-ons at this point in time. Grady Gross is now on scholarship at kicker. Everything else has been a walk-on. So when you look at the special teams, there is an element of, I know it's kind of hard to carry. Some people might ask, do you really need a scholarship on snapper? Well, yes, you do. Because when we so, we'll go look at A.J. Cardi and his time at Washington, your point, Jaden Green and his time at Washington, there's always been that one guy that you just don't really think about for three or four years but because you don't mention for three or four years, it means he's doing his job for three or four years. And that's exactly yep. why you want to get an experienced long snapper in there, just so you don't have those issues. Because the second you do, then you start to ask, oh, hey, how come you guys didn't recruit a scholarship long snapper? How come you don't do this? But well, we don't want to waste the scholarship on that. Well, you just lost the game because of it. So I know fans will say, oh, it's a long snapper. Who cares? And and I, I, much, specialists are people too. Kickers are people too. Punters are people too. Long snappers are no different. To your point about tomorrow, it's Davis. It's a perfect landing spot for him at Cal because it, he allow, it allows it allows him to go back. Or UCLA, sorry, yeah, but allows him to go back down to Southern Cal. Sorry, is what I was going for there. there down to go. his home, down to, down to his roots. But it also does provide future kind of availability for him to play potentially next season at UCLA. In sure. terms of that, will because when you looked at the Washington room, we touched on it. We don't need to go too deep into it. Just when you look at the room, especially with the way DeMond Williams has played, no slight to Demarcius Davis. DeMond just came in two, three, four car lengths ahead of him and couldn't close that gap. He's having long strides because Demarcius does have some long strides, but he just couldn't close that gap. And so this allows a fresh start. Deshaun Foster, now the head coach of CLA, perfect building block to go with. It's kind of, in a way, almost like how Ethan Garbers went back after signing with Washington years back, ends up going to UCLA and makes a career out of it. That's kind of what these quarterbacks need to do, where there's no sense in wasting two or three years sitting behind somebody just to play for one year because NFL teams need to see two, three years at least of playing experience, and you can't do that bouncing around from school to school. So it allows DeMarcy's to places to just come home, land, 
and start to b- grow his roots out down to UCLA. Yeah, absolutely. So we wanted to make sure we, we touched on those notes really fast because as, as all our everydayers on YouTube can see, that doesn't equate to transfer portal madness, like the name of the segment. So we, we just really need to talk about what else could possibly happen where I think what both you and I are looking for are just more additions in the trenches. I'd love to see, you know, one more skill player here or there. Like I would love to see an Elijah Badger on this roster. I, you know, if Jacoby Matthews, those are the two names that have been floated in terms of just other positions, but it really is all going to come down to the, to the trenches. And the one thing that, you know, we, we got caught up in this as well. When, before the transfer portal opened, there was all this hype from all these national media members saying, this is going to be the craziest transfer portal, uh, just, period ever. We've never seen anything like this. There's going to be all this talent that's going in. Teams are going to, you know, lose entire rosters, whatever. That didn't really happen. And especially along the offensive line. So we've seen, you know, at, at just as the rumors have gone on, uh, teams have been, I, the, the only word to use is overpaying because that's what it is at this point, have been overpaying for, you know, players that weren't expected to be worth as much as they have been. And, Washington just needs to find a way to get some more of these quality bodies in the room. And I, for one reason or another, they haven't been able to do that just yet. So we need to just look at the offensive line and find some bodies in the portal where, you know, we were sitting there with our good buddies from Huskies wire, Ben Glassmeyer and Alex Katzen in, in the press box at the spring game on Friday, looking through the transfer portal, trying to see who might be a good fit, who might have the experience and we really couldn't come up with a lot of names. It was it was really difficult to find some of those guys. And see, we'll see the key with that, because with that exercise, I've been doing that for a couple of weeks now. I'm really doing that right now, actually. And when you look at there are enough guys in the portal with FBS or even some FCS level experience, and the coaches have shown sure. level does not necessarily matter, right? They added they kept Sebastian Valdez, who committed from Montana State along the defensive line. You add D'Angelo Titiali along the offensive line from Portland State. And so it's not necessarily that getting lower level guys is the worst thing in the world, especially if they do have starting experience, but it almost becomes like taking a two-way player instead of a six-a player, right? To, to, to create it to a high school level where, okay, we know that you can ball and do great things at this level, but can you actually play that same level up here where we play? And there's no slight to a player. It's just a matter of fact where – there's a reason why you have the Power Five conferences, the G Fives, and, and and levels and divisions, but there's also a number of tackles uh, right right away that I look at. I mean, Anthony Pat, a offensive lineman from Arizona who hasn't played much but seems like a depth piece, could be a safe depth reserve guy that the coaches have familiarity with. And now again, we, we, I'm just speculating on names, right? This, this I no, I think that's. Like a, well, no, no, I'm sorry. I just want, I, I just want to interject real fast because I'm really glad you brought that name up where that's one where I would be surprised just in terms of how a lot of the other Arizona transfers have gone. And that's a guy who doesn't come in at this point. And it's something where I'm sure if fans see that they're not going to be overwhelmed to say, oh, this is a guy who's certainly going to start, but it's quality depth. And it's something where even if he doesn't have a start under his belt at this point, that's something where you can say, all right, at least he's, and it's, it's weird that we have to talk about it at this level but at least he's practiced and gotten experience against, you know, FBS bodies for three, four years at this point. So you can still have a guy who can have that experience and bring depth and just bring a little bit more to the room than a, a red shirt freshman might be able to. Exactly. And the other area to consider when you look at some of these guys in the portal is former junior college players who maybe only spent one season out of school and now are back in the portal where guys that do have other playing experience but maybe don't didn't necessarily get it at their last school, this new staff can come in with Brennan Carroll and say, hey, we're willing to give you a clean slate. We see that you had JUCO experience, obviously Quentin Moore with JUCO experience. There's a number of guys, um, Justin Harrington, a defensive back, another JUCO guy with experience who goes to Oklahoma for some years, doesn't play a ton. But you're just trying to take what's in the portal because you can't go and get who's not in the portal now. So when you look at who is in the portal, it's not great. But everything the coaches have said this spring is through the spring was how projectable are they, right? I know it was a big deal with Steve Belichick saying how do guys project in certain positions. It's no different on the offensive side of the ball as well. When you look at some of these offensive linemen, six, you know, six seven, six six, three hundred pounds. If you're your dub, you kind of have to just look and see, okay, why is this guy not a take? Okay, he doesn't have great film or whatever. 
but you can't beggars can't be choosers at some point. So yes, it's good to take a, a, a pat, for example, just to get a familiar face in the room, but you don't want to just take five or six depth guys because then you don't really have anybody truly with starting experience. And that is just as bad and reprehensible as not taking anybody in general because you want a mixture of guys that have experience and guys that are maybe retro freshmen and things like that. But if everybody is, whether they're three, four, or five years in the program and they don't have starts under their belt, that's a problem because then nobody's sure. coming in with experience. So you're absolutely right. But I, I want to get back to one of the other things that you said right there, where it's you're going to have to widen your net and take some of these, you know, guys that you find projectable for one way, for one reason or another. And I feel like that's fine. And it gets back to something that, you know, you and I were some of the strongest proponents of, you know, a month, two months ago, when everybody's asking what's going on with the offensive line, what's, what's going to happen there. And we were the people preaching patience. We were the ones saying, Hey, you got to like, just let the process play out, see what happens, see who enters the portal, and then you go from there. And now we've seen how that process has played out, and it's time to find a way to, yeah, use whatever scouting you know abilities you have to your advantage and say, oh, yeah, we like this guy who might play in the big sky right now, but we think he's big, he's athletic, and he looks really good down there. And if we can refine this, this one or two things, yeah, this is somebody that we believe we should take and find a way to bring in where, yeah, he's got that starting experience at a lower level, like you said, but you can still find a way to make that work. And Lars, with that being said, we're going to get out of here for today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. We've got so much more fun stuff coming for you throughout the offseason, recruiting, transfer portal. We're going to get some interviews on here. We're going to have so much fun. So make sure you subscribe to Lockdown Huskies wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We're there. We're everywhere. We're updating this channel with new content every single day. So please make sure you hit that like button. Leave us a comment down below if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Make sure you click that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. And if your audio only please leave us a five-star review as it all really does help out a lot thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you on wednesday